A quick disclaimer, opinions of host and guest do not represent the views or opinions of functional movement systems. Always consult your physician before beginning any exercise program. This general information is not intended to replace your healthcare professional. Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Some do it for the intense competition. Others do it for the mud, sweat, and beers. Regardless, adventure racing has become a wildly popular worldwide sport. Today, we're excited to have Mike Diebler on our show. Mike is the founder and co-owner of San Diego Premier Training. He has an extensive background in training and preparing athletes for adventure racing. We discuss what defines adventure racing, who is participating, and how Mike helps these athletes reach their goals. We cover nutrition, common movement problems found in adventure racers, and how they can gain more efficiency in their training. So get ready for another episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. Well, we're back, Ray. Uh, appreciate everybody joining us today. And today we got a pretty interesting topic. Uh, the uh, this whole kind of probably its own little culture, own little own little thing, adventure racing that we're going to get into today. And to be honest, uh, you nor I have <laughs> I have zero personal experience doing this, and I've known you long enough. And even though you get out in the woods and play around a little bit, I don't think anybody's uh, you're doing any type of racing in the woods to, to call yourself adventure racing. When I was 14, we used to leave the house on dirt bikes and get about 30 miles away from home. And there were a lot of adventures and a little bit of racing, but I don't think that's what uh, he's going to tell us about today. But uh, Nope. And, and since you nor I have a lot of experience, we got uh, someone who's got a lot of experience, uh, Mike Diebler, who's the owner operator of San Diego Premier Training. And He's a former Division One athlete, and, and he's actually done a few of these. And, and Mike, uh, really appreciate you coming on and being able to give us a little bit more insight into, you know, since you do train a lot of these individuals and you've got some personal experience yourself, kind of lending your insight into this. And, of course, uh, Gray and I will throw our two cents in. So I really appreciate you coming on today, man. Yeah, super happy to do this. It's, a, it's such a fun activity. Uh, we get such a wide range of types of people that want to do it, and uh, I think this is going to be a great topic. So let's let's uh, kick this off by helping me out a little bit and just define what an adventure race is or an adventure yeah what what we an adventure race because I think these have over the last probably 10, 15 years have become quite popular. Yeah, and I think with adventure racing is a very broad term that can go in a lot of different directions, right? I think it has some characteristics of it's multidisciplinary, right? You're you're gonna have to do different things. It could be running. It could be swimming, climbing, uh, biking, uh, trekking, a, a whole born, a bunch of different things that you would have to get into. And you're going to go through some pretty rough terrain and you're going to have to get through some type of course. And sometimes you know the course and it's going to be something you, you it's pre-planned. And other times you're going to have to figure it out and orienteer your way through. So uh, a lot of different types of race fall in this category. Uh, my my personal experience is a lot with the the obstacle course races that have just blown up over the past few years. Um, but it can include a lot of different other types of, of races out there. So it's, it's a broad category that I, I think it meets several of those categories where you're going to have to do a few different things. You're going to have a bunch of obstacles in your way, and that can be what you think when you hear an obstacle, or it could be just the terrain and you're going to have to traverse your way through some pretty tough stuff and sometimes not even really knowing where to go there. Well, let me let me come at this because uh, obviously the race component means you're going to attract athletes, and mm -hmm. the adventure component means you're probably going to attract some outdoorsy people that really don't want to play under the lights uh, or spend too much time in the gym. They want to get out and get after it. So you've got the adventure outdoorsy people wanting to get a little more competitive, and maybe you've got the triathlete who may not be at the front of the pack on an organized flat course with all the obstacles removed, but may think they might be able to bring a higher level of athleticism. Is that about a 50-50 group coming? And you got to make some outdoorsy people athletic and some athletic people self-aware that nobody's going to remove the roots <laughs> off the course for you today? I mean, how does that work out? 
Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. You get so many different backgrounds, um, you know, myself included. I, I came from nothing like this, but I love the idea of play and uh, a challenge and maybe doing something I didn't know if I could finish. And then you have the uh, the pretty competitive athletes that, you know, they did the triathlons, they did the marathons, they they did that world. And for whatever reason, you know, they may still do it or they've kind of decided I need the next step. I need something a little bit different. And then you just get the person that's like, uh, I don't know what I'm getting into. My friend talked me into this and it looked kind of fun and I'm terrified and I want to see if I can do this. So it's, it's a pretty fun atmosphere because you get so many different backgrounds in there. And, and Mike, we talk about defining these. You're talking about something like a Spartan race that, you know, some of these, I would, I would say maybe entry level that almost anyone who, who anyone can do that are pretty short, but they throw these kind of man-made obstacles out there where you've got to climb over this thing. You got to go through your mud, the tough mudders. I mean, mm -hmm. are those kind of the, the one side of it? Then you've got these longer duration ones that you're actually running through the mountains yes. and, and doing that. So you got those two really ends of the spectrum, right? Absolutely. So you have, um, you know, even with Spartan races, you have different categories within there. Uh, there are definitely levels for beginners that they can kind of get a taste for what they're getting into. And then they'll have some pretty hardcore ones that not everybody's gonna, it's not something you just go try out. It's something you better prepare for, or you're going to, you're not going to make it. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Um, but then you have the other outside of traditional obstacle course races where, um, even to get in, they have kind of that vetting process where they're just not going to let anybody in it. Cause you need to, you need to know what you're doing before you take on some something like this. So what, what's your personal experiences in these, uh, Mike? What, what have you done to kind of set the stage for really what everybody wants to talk about is how do, we tr how do you train these people? So what, what, are, what are some of the ones you've done? Yeah, so uh, the most common ones I've done are I've done all the different types of Spartan ones. So that's uh, me personally. That's what I train myself for. And most of the clientele that I'm working with are doing either Spartan races or some of the other brands like Tough Mudder, Savage Race. There, there's a whole bunch of different branches. You know, same idea. It's a race, man-made off. Well, some man-made, some some are going to be out there and you're going to have to get up the mountains and and crawl under things. And, and they'll they'll do a good job working it into nature as well. Um, but that's definitely more my experience with, you want to tell uh, us how you did, uh, I've, I've done really well and I've done not so well. It, it just depends on when you got me. Um, I'm, okay. I'm pretty competitive. Um, you know, when I look at my very first one I ever did, it's, you know, you kind of get punched in the face, especially when you walk in having no clue, uh, what you're doing. This is, you know, back in I believe 2013 was my first one where it was kind of one of those things where a bunch of clients were talking about it. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. I've heard of mud runs and I've heard of these different challenges, but I really can't give you a good idea of what to expect because I've never done it. It's just basically what I've heard. So my wife and I decided, hey, more and more people are asking us what this is. We need to go just sign up and do it. So we did it together. And um, honestly, going in, I thought I was going to hate it. I was like, I, I don't want to go run. I'm not a runner. I don't want to go crawl through the mud. That just doesn't sound like a good a good time to me. But, you know, I'm, I'm willing to try it. And and get out there. And I remember my first, you know, the first like 10 minutes of the run, I'm trying to jump over puddles and I'm trying not to get my feet wet and uh, trying not to get too dirty. And then it's all of a sudden, hey, you got to jump in this lake and then go crawl through that mud. And it's like, well, there's no jumping over that. I got to just just dive in and go. And uh, I missed a lot of obstacles. Uh, it, it was a challenge. I was hurting afterwards. I had to throw away all my clothes because I just was running, you know, wearing running sneakers through the mountains, which doesn't work real well. And I just got a quick lesson that this is something if you want to do, uh, you, you definitely have to prepare for it in, in a lot of different ways. And uh, but you know what? It, it definitely I caught that bug where it challenged me so much. And it was something I've never experienced before that I I just had to try it again. And I knew I could do better. And the more I did, the more I started to learn, hey, there's very specific things you can do to get better at, at racing like this. And, you know, you, you bring a lot of natural athleticism to an event like that. But the one thing natural athletes don't ever have to worry about, unless you're a football player and it's a rainy day, is traction control, right? You're optimizing traction in a running or locomotive sport whenever possible, wearing the right shoe on the right surface. When you bring your athleticism 
to a muddy, uh, you know, course that's up and down, traction control is there. You could obviously go faster, but if you can't trust your traction, and I think that's where maybe the difference in people who know the natural environment can be a little more conservative, and it's the tortoise and the hare thing uh, mm -hmm. when they go, whereas you've got to teach athletes traction control because they got way more horsepower than they can dump on this muddy downhill right now, you know, yeah. and you, you've got to use it differently. And that brings me to the question, when, when you're intaking these people, you obviously, personality-wise, you know where they're coming from. What are some of the, the questions you ask and the things you do, the history you take, and, and you're setting up a program? Because I'm pretty sure you're not a cookie-cutter guy. You're not putting everybody on the conveyor belt for adventure racing, and they just pop off the other end with these skills. How do you, yeah. how do you stage that early relationship and then know which way to go? Because I guarantee you people listening right here have had a touch. And I'll just tell you this, 30 years ago, I'm in uh, Decatur, Illinois, and two physicians come to me, and they want me to train them to do the border to border, which is a race across Minnesota, where you run, bike, and canoe together, and you got to portage the canoe. And these are marathon guys. And the first thing I noticed was their weak link. They had no springs. They, they were just, you know, flat pavement runners. And part of my training was we were doing jump rope. And it smoked them so quick, but I'm like, when you're running through the woods with a canoe on both your shoulders and the terrain is changing and your visibility is compromised, I want you to have very, very happy feet. Uh, <laughs> I know you got good hips and quads, but I want your feet to be ready for this. And that's, that's all I had. I didn't have a movement screen at the time. I had a little bit of orthopedic background. I'm like, we got to get you guys jumping rope. And it probably helped them on the poor dodge. I don't think it helped their cycling and marathon at all, but that's where we were scared they were going to dump is carrying that canoe. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny that that's actually the first, the very first adventure race I ever did was something similar to that with canoeing, mountain biking, running with a partner. And, uh, I had never done any of those things. And, you know, I, I can definitely uh, get by with, with natural skill, but it, it's, uh, when you go against people that, that train, it's a, uh, it's a totally different game out there. Um, but going back to the, the intake where, where we're starting because of an event like this, there are so many boxes to check, right? I, you need to be able to do a lot of different things. So, uh, like looking my, my skill, going back to how I was an athlete, I was a, a high jumper, right? I was very powerful, but very short duration. My strength was I take eight steps and then I jump over a bar and then I rest for like 10 minutes. You know, there's not you many- You lay sports. on a big fluffy mat for a while, right? Exactly, right? <laughs> and and that, was, that was it. So I had a lot of power. Um, so jumping over walls, uh, I can, you know, that was not a big deal because I just run up to it, jump over and I'm fairly tall, long reach. So, you know, looking at, I knew exactly, you know, starting with myself, because I was just trying to train myself before I took on any clients on how to, how do you get ready for this? I can easily say, well, I know where I really am going to excel. So, you know, maintain that stuff, keep, keep going and doing what you're doing. That's just your natural ability. But I can see where I'm lacking. I went from, you know, uh, being that, that typical, you know, type two, you know, just power athlete to now you have to go run starting maybe a 5k, a 10k, a marathon. Like that was definitely not something I was, I was, you know, built to do and, and definitely had to train for. So I can start to see, I can excel here. I can, I can definitely make improvements here. Now I'm finding the opportunities where I'm going to have the most success. So when I started taking in clients, that's how I was looking at it, right? There's, you need, and that's why I love that. And I, why I think so many people love this sport because of all the different abilities your body should be able to do. And there's a good chance it, it doesn't do them all well. Now we can start to determine where can we get the most benefit from, from your training, right? Is it maybe you lack power? Is it that you lack that endurance? Is it, um, all of the above, right? So you, maybe you're, this is just something totally new. So in that intake, it's, it's really important to determine where their strengths are. And then obviously with an FMS background, if we don't move well, we're not going to really build any of those things on top of it. So we're going to check those boxes first. I want to make sure I understand, you know, is this, is this just a basic, you know, movement problem and we can start there. And now once I, I feel comfortable loading you up and, and doing these different things, now we can build off of that. You know, it's interesting, Mike, because I think what you just described, it is about finding that weak link. And I think 
you know, obviously the FMS, you know, that's what we've always, you know, talked about since the late nineties is let's find out where your weak link is. Okay. Put the FMS aside when you're training someone that's, you know, especially for something like this, that's really going to, you know, put their body through the, through the paces, um, finding out what they have to really focus on and shine that light on where their weakness is, is huge, really, really important at this level. And so you, you obviously do that, but do you still need to do some sort of training on the things that they're good at? Is the idea to say, all right, you're good at these things, let's maximize that so you can maybe get a little bit better and, and have like a, you know, in your, your things, whatever, jumping over objects or whatever it is, you can excel through those knowing you're going to lose a little bit on these other things. Yeah, no, I know that I mean, there was a lot there, but does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And I think a lot of it comes down to they probably enjoy those things too, right? So I don't want to take away, you know, for me, I love jumping. You know, you throw some plyometrics at me, some box jumps and all those drills. If you tell me don't do those anymore, you know, that's going to have an effect on on my mentality of, well, but I love doing those things, right? But I don't want to spend my whole workout jumping because um, I know that's already pretty good. Um, but I want to maintain it and I always want to get better at those things. So I think it's still a balance, right? I want to determine where you're good. Let's keep training those things. Where do we need improvements? And then and then focus on there. And and sometimes it has nothing to do with with training, right? Another thing we have to look at is their recovery and their nutrition. And when I first work with an athlete, especially the ones that are working out a lot and they kind of have that more is better mentality. I'll tell them right off the bat, you know, I'm going to be your check, right? I'm going to keep your body in check. I'm going to keep your, um, you know, almost keep you out of your own way because people just have that idea of what I'm doing. I just need to do it harder and I'm going to get better. And I think that's the mistake most people fall into is there's so many different things we can focus on. You just have your eyes set on this one thing. And uh, hopefully I can broaden your, your picture a little bit on what we need to work on. Are you, are you doing heart rate variability with most of these people or most, I would imagine if they're into adventure sports, they've got some wearables and most of the newer, more progressive wearables have heart rate variability. And that's a, that's a great calibration just to get somebody acquainted with, because as far as I know, there's no placebo effect for that measure. And that's, that, that means that's a pretty good measure if you yeah. measure it correctly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's something that we, I, I personally try and do, uh, get my clients in the habit of doing it every morning. Uh, if they don't have something for heart rate variability, um, you know, I've, I've something I've really gotten into uh, is applying that to training. So usually if one client sign up, I, I kind of package it in. So they have they, if they don't have a some type of wearable technology to monitor it, I'll, I'll include it in the program because it's something I do believe in and make sure, hey, are we in overdrive right now and just need to take a step back or maybe you're not pushing it hard enough? You know, there's, there's definitely those people out there as well. So using that as a tool to measure our, our progress and, and recovery along the way. All right. Let me ask you another question because this is such a diverse group. If we were in basketball or we were in soccer or, uh, football, um, Lee and I could tell you out of the seven movement screen stations <laughs> where we're going to catch most people. And in field and court sports, we're going to catch you on anything that involves ankle mobility um, <clears throat> and maybe even core stability, you know. So, so are you getting a full spectrum of movement screen ones in this population or are you seeing them cluster around a few different mobility stability tests? I, I mean, I, I do see a range. I definitely think because of the nature of how most people set up their training for something like this, and really it's it's often overtraining um, mm -hmm. when they just get out there and they just run. And usually it's you wake up in the morning and you put on the sneakers and go out there. So we see a lot of ankle mobility restrictions. Um, but I'll, I'll couple that with, with um, hip and shoulder mobility restrictions as well. I think it's more of a mobility struggle that these type of clients are, are running into. And obviously there's the exceptions out there, but it's so much of either overtraining and just, just getting out there and trying to push so hard on all these different things. Or we have the opposite end too of the, the ones that just sit all day and you know the weekend warrior and they wanna take this on um, and they're just expecting that this kind of fixes all of their problems just by, by participating um, and not really looking at what they need to work on there. Well, I'm glad you said that because I want our listeners to hear this. When we're working with a group that's predominantly doing putting in the hours running or hiking or something like that, 
they're going to show with mobility problems because it's the way we consume these things. Now, um, I had a chance to talk to a guy named Eric Orton who trained Christopher from McDougal when he was doing the minimalist running and running down in the Copper Canyon and stuff like that. He goes, the guy that built my sandals uh, was probably 10 or 12 years older than me, if I recall the way he's telling it to me, and squatted, deep squat, ass to grass, heels flat, while he was building my sandals for more than 10 or 12 minutes. That same guy beat me an elite runner the very next day in like a 50 mile or something like that. So the fact that we've got this authentic culture that runs without a name brand shoe, basically a piece of rubber tied to their foot and has not lost their deep squat, but yet we see the deep squat, whether it be for ankle mobility or core pelvic control issues, that's the first thing a lot of people who log high mileage lose. And I honestly think it's because we run unbelievably supported with footwear and on usually flat surfaces. And adventure races aren't that. <laughs> they're, exactly. they're, they're these uneven surfaces. And when you come at these things without that deep squat, that's an authentic signature that your body has less mobility. But you and I both know if we change that mobility really quickly and it comes back the next day and it's gone again, that's really a high tension person who's using a lot of compensation. Whereas if we can't change that mobility at all, they're sort of fixed there. So under that mobility problem is either layers and layers of tissue restriction or it melts away and comes right back. And I think that's a misappropriation of training time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you nailed it right there with so many and, and, honestly, myself included, relying on that almost lack of mobility as, uh, you know, a false sense of stability to help in certain cases. And, and, you know, sometimes it might get you through, through something, but it's, it's has all this has a cost and it, you might get away with it for a while. But one thing, if you want to compete in a sport like this long term, and I think a lot of people who really get into it and enjoy it, um, they run into those problems where they're going to show themselves eventually. You want to improve your kettlebell workouts? Indian clubs may just be the missing link. While kettlebells are great at improving strength and power, Indian clubs are great at improving your speed, coordination, balance, and flexibility. Pairing these two can drive positive results across your entire workout. Club swinging is a perfect complement to kettlebell training. When you have compensation and struggle weight training, you often pick up bad form. It's almost impossible to get bad form with Indian clubs because those things either move or they're awkward. In the course, we cover classical moves all the way to advanced moves and even show you how they can be used as correctives in your workout. If you want a greater challenge, check out our clubs course at functionalmovement.com. Get 30% off the FMS Introduction to Indian Clubs online course using promo code CLUBCOURSE. That's promo code CLUBCOURSE for 30% off. Offer valid for a limited time only. So, Mike, obviously, you're, you're here talking to us, so you're, you do a movement screen. So, how different, or, or kind of take us through, someone walks in and they say, hey, I want to start training for one of these adventure races. How different is that intake compared to someone who just wants to come in and lose 15 to 20 pounds? Uh, it, honestly, it starts pretty pretty similar. Uh, we're going to still do our, our typical health questionnaire. We want to find out their background, um, and, you know, previous injuries and any medical issues and all of those pretty standard things that you're going to ask any client walking through the door because I want to make sure I, I just have as much information. Uh, I want to understand her why do you want to train for something like this? It's going to get hard. There are going to be times when you're going to question, is this worth it and things like that. So I want to understand what's the purpose, you know, what's, what's the ultimate goal? Is it just I want to finish and and get that medal. I want to win it. You know, we, we will see a whole bunch of different types of clients. So understanding that ultimate driving force behind it. Uh, once we have that information, then it's going through. Yeah, it just I want to look at, at how well you move because we might have to do a whole bunch of, you know, kind of weird things that most people aren't used to doing. And unfortunately, they shouldn't be weird, right? Like crawling and carrying things and, and jumping over things. Uh, we we really shouldn't have to train for a lot of the things that we see in a race. Um, but unfortunately we've lost so many of those uh, capacities that we have to, we have to see how much, how much can you, can you tolerate at this 
moment right now? Uh, or is it something we're going to have to take a step back and, and build that up from there? But really, it's it's not going to be that 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 different from uh, any type of client that walks in the door. We're all going to start at the same place. Now I just want to know what's the next step from there. So you, you get a few ones or you find some issues on the movement screen. You assign some correctives, work it right into the workout, maybe assign some homework. I think uh, a while back, I got to come to your facility, and I think we were doing some FCS stuff at the time. Yep. Um, and and that was very new in that, and you've probably had a chance since then to go through a formal, you know, on yourself, FMS and FCS. What in the FCS, ca- FCS caught you? Because I know it had nothing to do with the jumping part of it. Did, did you, <laughs> did you uh, get caught anywhere in that capacity screening process? Uh, uh- only really the only uh, capacity areas that caught me were it was jumping, but it was asymmetries, right? I'm I'm hitting I'm hitting those distances, whether it's single leg or um, you know multiple leg, uh, and but I am way dominant, right? I'm high jumper. You jump on one leg. I'm yep. really really good jumping on one leg. You Just out of curiosity, did did that show through in your motor control screens, or did it only really show through as a big asymmetry when you got into your well honed skill? The motor control I could hit. I, that was pretty uh, pretty spot on in terms okay. of uh, asymmetries. There, I was I was okay there. But when you asked me to develop max force, um, that changed the story a little bit. And now on my right side, it's really going to dominate compared to my left side. So that's where I saw the biggest changes. I think initially when I did it, I, I did see a, a, a significant, too much of a difference on hands versus no hands as well. When you allow me to use my hands, the amount of, of distance I can cover, when you take that away, um, and obviously relative, I can still jump pretty far, but not the same when you, when you allow my hands. So that actually, the first time I went through that brought in pretty interesting, you know, me to question my own training where how much I was relying on one piece. And, you know, obviously I always look back how much when I was competing as an athlete, you know, knowing some of this stuff right now, what it actually could have been like if, if I could have specifically, you know, looked at these specific things and how much more power I could have developed. So I I found that incredibly interesting. Well, now I'm thinking about the average client that comes to you. Let's say that there's nothing alarming on the screen, a little bit of mobility, stability tweak. You get into maybe an FCS with them. The very first thing they do is show you a huge asymmetry, upper or lower body on motor control screen, or they really suck on a, on a you know, farmer's carry. What, is, what does that tell you? Because we could go straight into the running stuff, but many of their running problems could be compensations for poor balance or poor postural integrity under load. So, you know, that, that operationally has given me more to work on after the screen than anything I had before, because it doesn't matter what sport you're in. I want to see your limbs have an equal amount of control on your torso. And then I want to see with a vertical load, if your torso can make the distance or not. Yeah. And I, you know, it's with that carry, um, it's really interesting. And I remember something you first talked about when looking at that particular uh, screen was how many people were using such a high threshold strategy. And I think a lot of times when you maybe have a little bit of limitation in mobility, that's, you know, that's just what we default to is just bracing and going. And you just see how much energy they waste essentially trying to get through this screen when it's it's really something you should just be able to hold this and and just go for a little walk we're not asking you know that much of a demand on the body that your heart rate is so highly elevated when we're just walking back and forth Um, that's a hell of an observation and and we did start putting heart rate monitors on people carrying and what we noticed is the average good carrier um doesn't have to go much out of their lowest cardio zone to make the mark. We do notice that high threshold people make the mark, but they do it exactly like they run every day in a zone that you and I both know is not favorable if they're ever going to get better. They're they're surviving this task, but they know how to high threshold up so quickly because they do it every day when they run. So I do think when you dial into training, 
if you know somebody, and you can see this earlier in their test, but if you know they're more high threshold, watch their heart rate response when they start caring, and they'll be treating it just like a sprint, not this organized thing where you, you know, a, a good carry, we see people shorten their stride, narrow their base, and start breathing in an appropriate way, and figuring out how to use less muscle in the carry as they go, not more muscle. So I think that's a that's a catch that that I was hoping we could bring up here because if you see people doing the carry at a high energy expenditure, I'd like to tell you they're doing it wrong because you're supposed to be doing it with your stabilizers and your alignment, not your quads and your traps. So. Yeah, and I think we I, I've seen it over and over again, the direct uh, relationship to just like you said, with their running, what it looks like and they're surviving their runs. And and it turns into and one of the big conversations I have to have with a lot of these athletes is understanding the goal is not just how hard can you push all the time, right? There, there's a time when you're going to push it and we're going to we're going to push your boundaries and struggle. But the whole goal of all this is to be efficient as possible, right? So when you're watching somebody carry, I think it's a clear window to see, are you efficient? Can you, can you relax as you carry this load? Or are you just going to brace and, and survive it, get through it however you need to get through it because you need this certain distance or this certain time? Um, but it's amazing. You see the people that they, they get through that, that screen with ease. Well, I shouldn't say with ease, but they can relax through it. They can breathe through it. They can, they can get through it. And then those that just, they hit the mark, but at the same time, it gives you this idea of, I know as soon as I get you out running, what it's going to look like right now. So now for that individual, maybe taking a different approach and we're going to do more aerobic training and get you to, to learn how to get in these lower intensity zones, right? Because you just want to go push it, push the limit red line, every single workout thinking I need to run further, I need to run faster, um, but missing the idea that it's it's also about efficiency. And that's that's kind of the, the key to success, I mean, really in any sport. An so, observation that we have with the high threshold carry is somebody who carries correctly in those lower um, cardiovascular ranges, like you said, they can come back day after day and repeat that feat. The person who hits the mark but does so at a huge cardio expense over time, if you watch them do that heavy carry over a month, they would start to erode. When we try to fix the heavy carry, what a lot of people who look at the FCS don't understand is we test heavy, but we train light. We do the six position carry. We try to make it multidimensional, you know, th things like that. But uh, I do think that, that even though you pass the test, when you see that high threshold, if you tried that test again tomorrow, it wouldn't be quite as good. The next day, it wouldn't be quite as good. And the people doing it correctly can repeat it day after day because it's more like work capacity than, than you know, uh, high-end cardio. Well, and just one thing on that, then I got a question from Mike. When, when you say do it correctly, that's what we're testing. And when someone does it poorly, we know that, you know, we don't have to say, really, we're, let me just describe the test. Basically, we say pick up a heavy object and see how far you can walk. That's pretty much... Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's some other nuances to it, right? But that's what we're doing. And if you do it inappropriately, you're just not going to be able to go as far. So when we say do it incorrectly, you guys are talking about the strategies, but I think where some people don't get how we do our test, if you have an inappropriate strategy, you're going to do the test poorly. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Like you're going to, your time is not going to be as good. So we don't need to be, so when we do a test like that, and this is more not for you guys, but for the listeners, we know you're doing, you're not, you do not have the proper strategy because the time did not meet the criteria. So I think too often confused, what we, how people get confused by some of the testing, they're so caught up in watching someone, well, how did they pick it up? Are there traps on or this or this and this? Well, we just got to sit back and watch the clock because the clock is going to tell us if they had a bad strategy or not. Because you just said, if they do the right strategy, they're going to be a walk for a lot further. So that's one thing about some of the tests we look at. So we don't need to get into the nuances of what you look like, just like a, a, talking about some of the jumping. If you don't jump as good on one leg as you do the right, I know you have a bad strategy, right? Mm -hmm. But my question, uh, Mike, to you, one of the common, most common questions we get is, how do you have the conversation with a person that you know, one, I know a person walking in the door that tells me, hey, I'm training for a triathlon. Well, Crap, they're type A. They're going to run through the wall before I can get them to stop. So mm -hmm. 
overtraining is probably is what you said earlier is one of the most difficult things you probably have when you're training someone like this because we know that once they start overtraining they're they're slip that's a slippery slope to having an injury so how do you have that conversation with these people who are going to want to run through that wall and run all day to tell them listen what's going to help you the most is to not run today so walk us through that kind of you know kind of you know mental <laughs> jujitsu you've got to do with those people yeah, obviously, in any any athlete you're working with, or you know, just just client coming in that wants to do, they have their mindset on something. This always becomes a difficult conversation. But I think uh, making sure there is the the buy-in that you are the professional, you know, what's in their best interest, and you're looking out for them. So any way we can we can convey that message to them. Uh, this is one of the reasons I like using something like HRV because it is a way just to, to monitor, because really all it, the big thing that gets people to focus on is, are you sleeping and are you taking care of your body? And if you're not doing those things, we're gonna see some of those numbers start to jump, jump all over the place. And um, we wanna make sure they understand why we're doing this in the first place. So if we can get some type of monitoring in, it shows them we're, we're you know, we, we have the brakes on right now. We're not gonna get the results that you're looking for without taking those breaks off. And here's how I think we can take those breaks off, whether it's taking that day off, just focusing on some other aspect. And that's a nice thing with this type of training. There's a lot of different things we can train for that aren't all the same strategy, right? A lot just get one, they might get so caught up in the, the specific obstacles that they're going to have to face. And all they do is hang from stuff and work on their grip. And now their shoulders are destroyed and their elbows, and they've just been trying to crush everything that they see. Um, and they never paid attention to the running at all, right? Or, or their aerobic capacity and, you know, their resting heart rate's 75 or 80. And it's it's just trying to shift the focus where they, they can see. So at least if we have some baseline measurements of, you know, this is where you should be for resting heart rate or strength levels or whatever it might be, we can show them this is, you know, if you want to get on the podium in this type of event, this is what these these guys are, or girls are doing. Um, so we need to level off some of the things you're doing versus focusing on this one, one thing there. So I'm not going to say you, you're not running anymore or you're not climbing on any obstacles. We just need a little bit more balance in the program there. So hopefully we can just create that buy-in and show them there's all these different aspects of this type of event that we need to train for. You're just, you're putting all your eggs in this one basket and we need to focus on some of these others. I, I like the fact that you brought that up because resting heart rate is what we were using before HRV was convenient to track. But what I've I've found in my limited training when I'm wearing a trainer's hat as opposed to a physical therapist's hat is I have to have one physical manifestation of that lack of readiness. And so if I am already looking at HRV, I have found with many of my hard charging athletes, pro athletes included, I have to have a physical manifestation of this theory, right? Because they're still looking at HRV as it's something that I have access to, but they don't. So in the old days, I always knew what was their biggest issue on the movement screen, whether it be low score or asymmetry. Nowadays, it's so easy and convenient. And I want our listeners to hear this, that motor control screen that you can do with your shoes on that is the tip of the iceberg of the YBT takes a signature of motor control. So when you get jacked up, if you lose a little ankle mobility, we got you. If you get jacked up and lose a little core stability, we got you. If you get jacked up and you're breathing a little inappropriate, we got you. So if they come in with HRV not being back where it's supposed to or a high resting heart rate, usually the motor control screen, if I've got a baseline with it that's not completely favorable, and we've worked our way out of that, they will actually post a low score on a lower body or upper body motor control screen. And you and I both know, you've only invested 30 seconds. Now I have a physical manifestation of no matter how hard you just tried, you didn't coordinate motor control. That motor control is reflective of your state of readiness. So I want everybody out there, if you're going to lean in and do HRV, you're either going to have to dump a lot of theory on them, or you're going to have to quickly and practically turn it into a physical test that they also take a dip on today. Why would we push hard when we already know your reaction time and motor control is less than it was 
yesterday when your HRV was where it was supposed to be. So I, I've, I've found that that has been very helpful to create a physical kinetic manifestation that demonstrates the lack of readiness that was, according to them, in theory only because it's a number, not a physical feat that they could try to overcome. So, Yeah, that makes total sense. And because so many always feel like they're on, right? Even when, yeah, I'm a little tired, but I can still... I can break through that wall if I have to. And it's like, well, we don't have to break through the wall. The door is right there, right? We'll just walk through. We just have to be smart about how we do this. Well, we all feel on after two Red Bulls, but that doesn't mean yeah. <laughs> we started that way. So I, I think a lot of people do on that on that day when they're just not motivated. And I've, I've been there for 15 years. You just reach for an artificial stimulant as opposed to your rest and nutrition and your hydration and your breathing as being that engine right? You, you, yeah. you get amped up, you got a little endorphins going with exercise, and now you just created a debt that's going to take you two days to repay. And, yeah. and it's yeah. nice to be able to watch that. But yeah, converting that to a physical manifestation. I got one other thing. You, yeah. you leaned right into efficiency. And I had to teach myself how to run after my neck surgery from the ground up. And I was also reading some stuff about uh, Dr. Phil Maffetone. And he was sort of that, that chiropractor back in the 80s that started looking at triathletes that had a lot of musculoskeletal issues and realizing that they were running at a, at a, you know, a heart rate that was a little bit higher than they should be. And he noticed if he put a roof on their heart rate, a lot of the biomechanical problems that they would have when running weren't nearly as obvious to the naked eye as when he let them move the roof up 10 or 20 beats. So he started basically lowering the roof on your cardio, not because he was trying to be the world's best endurance guy. He was trying to keep musculoskeletal stuff in check because even if you got a good movement screen, and you're running 20 beats higher than you're supposed to, you're going to make subconscious poor biomechanical decisions because now you're running at your cardio artificial limit, not your rhythm limit between cardio and biomechanics. And so what do you think about the Phil Maffetone stuff? Are you incorporating some of that low steady state? Because the first time I went out and ran and I was trying to follow the Maffetone method, I think I posted a 14-minute mile. But I did four of them without stopping. And so that, that blew, my, blew my mind that I did have the capacity to hit four miles, but it was way more at a humbling cadence than I thought. But anything above that, I was jarring my neck. I had bad mechanics. I was hitting the ground too hard. I, I whittled that down a little bit, but I'm wondering where, where are you with that compared to some of the other ways that we train in intervals or some of the pre-Wem Hof stuff that we could do? Where are you sitting there? I, I mean, I like a mix of, of both. Um, you know, the, the idea that 80-20 principle, you know, of 80% of our time spent in some of those lower intensities um, you know, when they look at a lot of those elite runners, that's just what they naturally do. Most of their running is at that lower intensity. Now, when you watch them, you don't realize that, right? They're running sub five minute mile and that's still low intensity for them. Um, but it's all, all in perspective, right? The ease that they, you know, anytime you go watch elite runners, it always looks like it's with ease. And that's, that's kind of the point that we're trying to get to. And this is one of the hardest conversations I feel like I have with clients is understanding all of the benefits that they get. And I think one of the big things that, like you were saying, how repeatable these types of workouts are, right? If you are trying to push that tempo every single run and you're trying to run multiple days per week, which you may have to, you know, depending on the race that you're training for, uh, there's a huge cost to that. And it's going to carry over and carry over. And you're always going to feel like you're catching up versus toning it down staying in some of those lower intensity zones, you can repeat that day in, day out. You can make those longer distances. You can get more time on your feet. And, and I think that's the big thing people miss. They get so caught up maybe on mileage or, or things like that. But when we go into these races, you're not running at your normal pace. It's not a road race, right? If I'm working with a runner, I know, hey, a five, 5K is a 5K. We, we know what the course is going to be like. It's, it's on the road, whatever it might be, or a 10K. You have very uh, specific parameters that you're working with. With a race like this, it's up the mountain. It's down the mountain. You're crawling. Your pace is going to slow, right? You're, you're not going to be able to run your normal, you know, 5K pace in a 5K 
obstacle course race. So I need you to understand that, yeah, you might run a 5K in 30 minutes, um, but a 5K obstacle course race might take you an hour and a half, right? So I need you to understand that your body has to be um, able to, to withstand that duration, not just the distance. And here we just have that balance. And I think one of the best ways to do it is just more exposure, more exposure at low intensity. It's, it's one of those things. Things just naturally tend to uh, correct themselves when you just go easier, when you slow down and you're not trying to push your limits. You're not overstriding. You're not doing all these, you know, like you said, subconscious things that just come out because you're just, again, trying to survive your run and get out, get done as fast as you can versus, you know, just thinking about some things that we're working on or, or, um, you know, having that limit, making sure that heart rate stays below a certain intensity throughout the run. So the, the amount of benefits to something like that, I think, uh, can't be said enough, but a lot of times people don't want to hear that. That's, that's so counterintuitive to endurance culture because they think VO2 max and how much energy can I squeeze out of my heart as opposed to thinking how much lubrication and efficiency can I have in my body? And, and I think what you said, that little bit slower on-ramp with both your cardio gives your tendons, your ligaments, and your cartilage time to go through a stress recovery cycle. And just because you're young and your heart can handle five days of abuse doesn't mean your knees can, doesn't mean your plantar fascia can, doesn't mean your low back can. And so I honestly think that that, that cardio limit that we can watch when we're training pushed right up against the biomechanical limit that you're perfectly aware of if you're just screening a few things gives you that, that very comfortable zone where don't, don't question this for two weeks and then let's retest a bunch of things and it blows them away. What are, what are some of the common flaws that, that you see being able to bring to the surface when people follow that advice? That are they, do they not you know, immediately become aware of? Uh, well, I mean, I, I was just thinking, you know, as you were talking, I, so many times a client has told, I, I think we get so easily buy in when they do this, you have to, you have to give it that, that honest effort and actually stick to something like this. But so many times, uh, we'll have clients tracking, you know, I'm going to do a, a, a 30 minute, uh, you know, zone one or zone two run and keep the intensity low. And we know specifically what their heart rate should stay under and how far they get there. And or what their pace is, you know, you know, if I keep my heart rate at, you know, 150 beats per minute, you know, what's what's that running pace look like for me? Well, all of a sudden we've been doing this for a few weeks now and all of a sudden my pace has dropped where and my and it's I have to go a little bit harder or run a little bit faster to to get my heart rate up to where we're trying to, to get to. I think you get instant buy in when they start to see how much more efficient their body is. And I think that those actual changes happen pretty quickly. So that, um, I've had m multiple people when they actually give this a, a try, stick to those lower intensities, they see how much more efficiently they are running and it translates into a number. And I think that's easy when I can see I covered this much diff diff distance, but kept my heart rate low the entire time versus the last time we did this, this is a night and day difference there. And, and one thing I want to make our listeners perfectly aware of is the only reason you can do that is you went through the painstaking boredom of setting baselines in the beginning. And everyone listening to this podcast can say the exact same things we're saying, and the light bulb never comes on because you don't objectively mark time with a mobility stability signature and a cardiovascular signature. And the, the ability to think, holy crap, if I listen to this guy for a month, I can run 10% faster at the same heart rate as opposed to I can stress my heart into another level and go faster, maybe at the expense of my low back and, you know, my knees. So it, it, it's counterintuitive, but I honestly think that if we hold the line, it'll become mainstream. But I want our listeners to know you couldn't do what you do if you didn't have baselines you trusted and could go back to and say, I know how you feel, but this is what it looks like. And that's 
that's all they need to hear sometimes to stay out of that because you get sucked into an internet forum and it's all about what kind of numbers did you post? How high could you get your heart rate? Just like how much could you bench press? And yeah, we're going absolutely. the other way. We're going less is more. And if you can, if you can finish a race and not have to leave any skin on the course, <laughs> that's actually a good thing. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I, I always like the, the uh, thought of, uh, you know, adaptation versus performance, right? If you're in a race or in a, in, in a competition, things, things change, right? You're, you're, you're going to get to that, that finish line as fast as you can. We're going for performance. We're, we're going to, to see what, what all this training, right? It's going to display in that race. And we want to see what you got, what you can get through training. I, we want to have that idea of adaptation, right? I'm going to do a, a specific thing to your body and it will adapt. So we, we see a change. So trying to explain that message of, hey, we're going to adapt. This is how we adapt. This is what we're working on. So when you perform, we've just pushed your limits a little bit higher. We set the bar a little bit higher. Now you're going to be able to hit a level that you probably haven't hit before. So, Mike, one, one question I've got for you based off of the diversity of people that are coming in training. You've got the, the beginners. You've got the high-level elite what is, you know, we talked about the movement and the physical aspect. What about the nutritional aspect? What are some of the things you look at initially that you say, okay, this is a trigger. This is something we've got to deal with versus, okay, you're pretty good. I mean, you know, do you refer to a nutritional expert? Do you know, cause some of these people come in, they're probably, you know, eating great. They're, they're hydrating, but some, they need a lot of work. So what are some of the initial things that you consider for these beginners and what are some of the things when you get to that elite level, kind of walk us through that process. Yeah, I think, uh, we can intake and and look at food logs and, and obviously if it's something we're not comfortable with, it's, it's always something we can refer out, you know, with endurance athletes, there's always that risk. Is there an eating disorder? Is this something out of my scope of practice? And that's something we'll always have to uh, keep in mind because that is a serious problem for many people. Um, but if it's something just trying to, to get a little bit better, they eat pretty good, Um, we just need to understand, well, when a client tells me I eat great, what does that mean? Because that can mean uh, quite a few different things. Uh, so just taking a little bit deeper look Our nothing's gonna, you know, we, we can't skip that foundation, making sure they're eating, you know, high quality foods and not relying on, you know, stimulants and, and, you know, one particular food over the other. So just making sure we have that quality base there. And then really what I think like many things, we need the body to be able to use different types of fuels. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with, especially with endurance events, right? Where maybe it just becomes so carb heavy where we think we just need to load up with carbs or we have the other end where we just need to load up with fat. And, you know, if we want to go more ketogenic and obviously there's lots of different philosophies out there, but I think the principle should be the same. Your body, if you eat carbohydrates, it should be able to use those carbohydrates for energy. If you eat fat, you should be able to use that. So making sure we have that well-balanced diet. I know that's not the sexy, you know, cutting edge nutritional approach, but we just want to make sure your body can handle whatever foods that you're putting in. So we're getting good sources of a variety of nutrition there. So starting simple, looking at the, uh, the foundations of any nutrition program. Do we have that there? If not, What can we do to improve that? Then if we're going to get a little bit more advanced, do we need to look at, well, you're going to be out there for two hours. We have to look at your nutrition before, during, and after too to help fueling uh, in-race nutrition and then recovery afterwards. So even a beginner, that's if you're going to be out there for for multiple hours on a course, even if it's you're not running at an elite level and you're not prepared for something like that, you're you're not going to finish. You're going to bonk out. We're going to have some issues. So nutrition wise, obviously, it's a complex subject, but we have to look what's your regular routine look like. Are we just eating good, nutritious foods? And then are we making sure during training and during racing, we're covering all our bases for um, supporting your your activity? No, that's great, Mike. So when you say food log, give us an idea of what you mean by that. When you say keep a food log, you're saying like over a week, you're just documenting everything. Kind of kind of walk us through that because, again, I, right, I'm not – this is a really, really complicated subject, but I think – I like what you said. You got to keep it simple. Let's just start, start with the obvious. Yeah, I, I, literally I would like to see – basically make them show what they're eating because – 
people say, you know, whenever you ask what, what do you eat, it always is, it's the vegetables and it's the, the lean protein. But then when I actually look, when you wrote it down as you ate it, or when you took a picture or using an app, whatever it might be, it starts to show a different story. And now I can show them, you know, this is, this is what you're eating right now. Here's the direction I think we need to go. Here's two, one or two simple things I think you could do right now to make the biggest impact on, on that eating plan, whether it's, Hey, you didn't eat a single vegetable all week. Um, which I've, I've definitely seen things like that, or it's, um, you know, uh, just heavily carbohydrates, no fat, you know, just getting that balance in there. So a lot of different directions, but again, just like everything, I have a baseline. I know what you eat right now. And now I can build off of that with just simple, uh, lifestyle changes there. Well, two things that I've, I've always looked for in a, in a food log when I've worked with, with people like that is number one, when a per, even if they seem to be eating good, a lot of their nutrient is prepackaged, bars and, and shakes and, and gels and stuff like that. That's sort of a little bit of a trigger for me that they're not getting enough whole foods f- basically to keep their microbiome, their, their digestive tract functioning like it's supposed to. We're not supposed to be eating pre-pureed baby food or contained cookies that are a full meal. We're just not. And so there's got to be a lot of whole foods in there. And the other one I do for people that are going to beat on their bodies is there's a bunch of websites out there that talk about inflammatory foods. Uh, I think one used to be called deflame.com. And it basically brings to the surface that wheat, dairy, and sugar right? In, in refined and highly processed forms, don't they offer plenty of calories and they look somewhat benign and they get jacked into a lot of foods, but they are the ones later in life that can easily contribute to inflammation. And so if a good portion of your diet is creating a little bit of gut inflammation and then you stir up that patellar tendon, you've only got half the resources to deal with it because you're going to deal with the inflamed gut first because that's how you get sugar to your brain. And so your brain's not going to allocate any resources to a patellar tendon because all you got to do is walk and that doesn't hurt. But if we're not getting sugar to the brain, you got brain fog, it's going to mess up a lot of other things. So I look for a lot of prepackaged foods with the illusion that it's healthy. And I look for also a predominance of inflammatory foods. And these are, these are two populations of people that could calorically be eating the right thing, but inflammatory based or whole food based aren't. One other thing we noticed as far as you, the, the bigger the races get, the longer the races get, less of the people crossing the finish line first have a belt full of gel packs. Mm-hmm. And we noticed that in the NFL, um, so many of these sports drinks that we use for rehydration are high sugar, but there's certain people on the field, we still want to get all that sugar. And they're the ones with about 5% body fat that have the metabolism of a hummingbird. If we don't let them have some sugar, they start cannibalizing themselves, but that's a very small percentage. And so you can look at somebody body comp and realize when it's okay to sugar them during the race. But most of us don't need to sugar during the race and body comp and training logs can tell you that. Yeah. You know, that's, that's an interesting point too. When you, and I know they've done studies looking at like marathoners, when you have the elites finish and they look at something like their hydration levels, um, they're dehydrated, right? You finish a race, you're going to be worse off than when you started. And then they look at more of the recreational runners that are that are finishing towards the end, and they're even more hydrated when they started. Or they're totally like you shouldn't finish a race full. It, it's it's deplete. It should be depleting, right? We don't need to um, keep that level across the entire race. We want to see it, you know, deplete a little bit, and then we're going to refuel and deplete. So that's that's a a great point to bring up that it's it's okay to to have some of these uh, levels drop down. We're not trying to maintain a, a, a blood sugar level throughout the entire or see a spike in the race. So letting them understand that, hey, we can get whole food sources if needed, but it's it's you're going to test your body a little bit. We don't need to be eating every 10 minutes in order to get through a race. And if, if that's how we feel, we made a mistake in our training somewhere. Well, it would be proper to assume that the best, most efficient breathers are probably finishing forward in the pack if their biomechanics are commensurate. And we still got to realize, even on a hot day when you're sweating a lot, you're still losing 70% of your body's fluid through your breathing 
not your skin and not your urine because those breaths are happening continuously and the better breathers who are burning fats are going to breathe in more lengthy and efficient breath cycles than shallow breathers. So shallow breathers will probably conserve fluids, but the whole point is, if you know when the end of the race is, it's okay to be dehydrated because the race is over at that point. But I honestly think the best breathers are going to blow off a lot of CO2, they're going to process a lot of oxygen, and in the process, they're going to lose some fluid even if they sweat an equal amount. So I think that's a that's a really good thing is you're not, yeah, you're not supposed to finish hydrated because unless you're getting that hydration very clean, it's coming with calories that are probably going to mess up the way you're processing energy as opposed to facilitate it. Yeah. And, and actually tying it back to something we talked about earlier, that breathing thing, what an easy way to work that in to your training when we hit some of those lower intensity workouts. You know what you can do when you're, when you're running at a little bit uh, slower pace, you don't need your mouth open. You can breathe through your nose. And sometimes when I have a client, they don't have the heart rate monitor. They don't have all these things to track it. I just say, I want you to go run for 30 minutes, keep your mouth shut, breathe through your nose. And if you can't do that, you've, you've passed that ceiling that we set for you. So it's a nice way to practice that, to, to get better breathing mechanics, to sync it with your, your training and your running. Um, so there's a lot of benefit to that. No, I think that's something that, that occurred to me. I, 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 I love paddle boarding and paddle sports. I can go at a very high efficiency and breathe through my nose doing that when I get on a bike or a run not so easy. So I had to start having that talk with myself. I'm not a good cyclist. I'm not a good runner. But if I can accomplish both these with that exact same thing, like you're saying, I can keep my, my lips together, do mostly nose breathing. I feel like I could push harder but I know to do so, I'd have to open my mouth. And what does that give me? So I'm, I'm trying to post a number and not do it with integrity. But I do. So I, I would challenge our, our listeners, pick something in a cardio event that you do extremely well. And you probably find you can do it without resorting to mouth breathing. And then pick something that you don't do well. And you'll be there quick. And just to say, how slow would I have to go to nose breathe through this thing? It's going to be humbling. And in two weeks, it won't be nearly as humbling but I think that's a, that's a huge uh, feedback loop is just if you can do it mostly nose breathing, you're probably, if you're wearing Polar or something, you're probably in that lowest third cardio. And I think that's a respectable place to be. And I think that's where our ancestors kept most of their day, which is how they got through the harsh environments that we're trying to create in a venture race. And that was their wake up and get shit done. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, when you're working with a client, uh, just remind them, yeah, you might run that 14 minute mile. That's, that's okay. Right. It's going to get, it's going to get better. You just, this is something we have to practice. So, uh, real quick, uh, recap for us, give us the, the, maybe the top two or three overuse injuries you see and end up being part of the solution for, and then give us the top three, uh, unavoidable injuries. Uh, are they, are they cuts, lacerations, sprained ankles? What are they? But give us, give us that profile real quick of the people you're, you're helping. Yeah, I think overuse wise, they're going to be really similar, uh, to running. You're going to have those, that Achilles tendonitis or plantar fasciitis, just pounding the pavement, you know, a little bit too much. We, we definitely see a lot of that, uh, lower, lower body issues with just, just overdoing it and kind of not doing some of the things that we talked about. Uh, and on the other end, it is, a, especially in obstacle course racing, there is a lot of hanging type obstacles. And when we see that restricted mobility in the shoulders and we just try and go hang from a bar and try and get through monkey bars and, and climbing ropes and things like that. Uh, I think those are probably two of the biggest ones, the running related lower body injuries from just overuse, the tendons just taking a beating, and then that upper body just not being in a good position where you can hang. Uh, in terms of unavoidable, yep, you're going to get your scrapes, you're going to get some bruising. Uh, there's you know often barbed wire, rough terrain. Um, that's that's kind of a nature of the beast where where you're going to have some of those those cuts and and lacerations, but you know, typically nothing too serious. Just when you wake up the next morning or you hop in the shower, you, you've decided, you've learned all the places that you uh, have those cuts in there. So Lee, if you and I try an adventure race, uh, elbow pads, knee pads, mm -hmm. and helmets, uh, not happen. Not happen. <laughs> I chase deer through the woods and catch a few every now and then that's my adventure race now. So hey, that, that's all good. All right, Mike, this was great, man. It's just got a very interesting topic. Um, hopefully Got a lot of uh, a lot of people interested in adventure racing now, but thanks so much for for 
lending us your expertise on this. I really appreciate you coming in today, man. Uh, happy to be here. Happy to help. Great chat. And if you, you if you want one of these new FMS shirts that doesn't have sleeves in it, you just just text me and we'll 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 modify one for you. All right, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. That'll do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute to subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.